Well, thanks so much for joining us. We are going to start in just a moment. I see we have scores of participants still joining us. Very glad you're here for this special conversation. All right, well, let's get underway. My name is Wade Crowfoot, and I have the honor of serving as our California Natural Resources Secretary, which means I lead our state natural resources agency. Um, we do a lot of different things um, across the state, but fundamentally we're focused on stewarding California's environment. And of course, uh, being one uh, teammate in the fight against climate change. You are joining what we call a, our Secretary Speaker Series, where we bring big thinkers and leaders from outside of state government to come talk to us and to have a public dialogue about important issues facing California and the world. And I have to say, I am so excited with the conversation we have today uh, with one of my heroes, Dr. Catherine Hayhoe. You may know Catherine, Dr. Hayhoe, if you uh, have followed climate policy uh, for a very long time. She is a renowned climate scientist who is right at the center of the international discussion on how climate change is changing our world and what we need to do about it. She is also author of a best-selling book that I actually picked up this winter and frankly didn't put down until I read it. And it is called Saving Us, A Climate Scientist's Case for Hope and Healing in a Divided World. And so uh, I should also mention that Catherine Hayhoe is a professor at Texas Tech University uh, over in that small, insignificant state of Texas. Just kidding, Dr. Hayhoe. Um, and was uh, identified by Time Magazine as one of the 100th most influential people. Uh, and I have to say, Dr. Hayhoe, you have been an inspiration to us because not only are you helping us understand climate change, but you're helping others understand climate change that aren't necessarily tuned in. So I'm really thankful to spend uh, time with you here today, uh, understanding you know, your work and your ideas. Welcome. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's such a pleasure to be with you. Um, I've worked in California for so many years and this summer, I joined the Nature Conservancy as their chief scientist. And of course, the Nature Conservancy works all throughout California on work related to your 30 by 30 initiative, um, increasing fire resilience, working on drought and water management. So I'm looking forward to even more engagement with California because of that. Yeah, that, that is incredible. And the Nature Conservancy is really lucky to have you in that role. Uh, as, I, as, as we talked about, you know, really today we're joined uh, by a whole lot of people across the state, including policymakers, advocates, community leaders. And so we will spend uh, a little, little next 55 minutes really uh, unpacking a lot of important issues. I want to invite, if you're joining today as a participant, um, feel free to ask questions, share observations. There is a button on the bottom of your screen, the Q&A button. So all you need to do is type in your question or observation, and it'll come to me. And uh, as, as this conversation evolves, we'll make sure to integrate your thoughts into this discussion with Dr. Hayhoe. But listen, a lot of us know your work and, and know sort of who you are and where you come from. But for those who don't, um, just uh, just share a little bit about both sort of what you're doing now, but also uh, how you got here. Yeah, well, how I got here actually has a California piece to it um, because I, I, well, originally my undergraduate degree is in astronomy and physics. And I was planning to be a scientist when I needed to take an extra course as a breadth requirement to finish my undergraduate degree before I headed to graduate school. And I looked around and there was a brand new class that was being offered on climate change. And I thought to myself, and this is dating myself here back in the 1990s, I thought, well, that's interesting, why not take it? So I took it and I was completely shocked to learn that climate change is an incredibly urgent problem that affects every single one of us. And it affects those who've done the least to cause the problem in the first mm. place the most. It's profoundly unfair. So that was what caused me to, to pivot to climate science. And I knew I wanted to do something that was relevant to decision-making, not in the ivory tower, but in the real world. So I was working on the contribution of other gases besides carbon dioxide to international agreements like the Kyoto Protocol and now the Paris Agreement, 
when I got roped into doing a regional climate assessment for the Great Lakes region, which is where I'm from. It was a lot of ecologists looking at the impacts of climate change on the natural environment in the Great Lakes. And I realized that they were working with climate projections that were years out of date. It was the equivalent of, you know, working with a, a flip phone instead of a new iPhone. <laughs> That's yeah. how far out of date it was. So I said to the Union of Concerned Scientists who was sponsoring the project, you really need to be working with the latest climate projections. And they said, we'll call your bluff on that. We want to do an impact assessment for California. You're on the hook now. <laughs> so, so they put together this all-star team of California scientists because you are so rich in scientific expertise. The late Steve Schneider, who many people will know, Chris Field, Dan Cahan, all kinds of scientists from across the state who are experts in water, climate, the economy, air quality, scientists who are experts in wine grapes, very important. Yes. Also citrus crops and, and Central Valley agriculture, air pollution, beach erosion. They put together this whole team and I was tasked with generating the climate projections that everybody across the team could use. Wow. So this was, to my knowledge, it was the first assessment anywhere in North America that looked at the difference between a future where we keep on using fossil fuels and a future where we wean ourselves off fossil fuels and transition to clean energy. Up until that point, I mean, this might sound, you know, standard for everybody today, and today it is, thank goodness. But up until then, most of the studies have been done looking at mid-range scenarios, which sort of treated human uncertainty as a given, like, oh, we'll just end up in the middle. But the reality is we're the biggest uncertainty. Mm. All of us, we're the ones driving climate change. And we have to look at what's going to happen if we don't do anything and what's going to happen if we do everything we can, both to make sure that we're adapting for what we can't avoid, it's too late, but to make sure we understand why we want to act. Because, you know, if you didn't know that smoking caused lung cancer, I'd probably smoke. If you didn't know that, you know, that how, what we're supposed to eat or not eat or what you're supposed to save for retirement or not, a lot of us wouldn't be doing the right thing. So knowing the difference between our actions that's what actually causes us to take action on climate change. And that study that was published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences back in 2003 was, or 2004, I should say, was so successful that when Governor Schwarzenegger, who was the governor at the time, signed the first executive order in the entire United States for mandatory greenhouse gas emission reduction targets, he quoted from our study and he had a semicircle of our California authors standing behind him. Wow, that is incredible. So let me ask you this. Um, and also, you know, important to note that Governor Schwarzenegger was a Republican governor uh, at that time, and, and he demonstrated amazing leadership that we've maintained since then. Um, but, but let me, let me um, I'm going to come back to that, actually. Let's just do a, a little bit of the state of play of, you know, where we're at on climate change. Again, some of us follow this really closely, some of us don't. You know, 20 years ago, uh, you led this study to really identify what are what are the global warming projections and what how they impact California. I think you know non scientists like me would observe that it seems like climate change is accelerating, um, at least in some of the impacts that we're feeling. So, can you help us understand sort of the state of the science and what are key takeaways we should know now uh, about climate change and how it's impacting us? Well, that's exactly the word that I would use too: accelerating. When we look at global average temperature, it is tracking right alongside our projections. But when we look at what's happening at the regional scale, especially how climate change is loading the weather dice against us, hmm. global weirding rather than global warming, <laughs> when we look there, it is definitely off the charts. It is, we're seeing things today that we didn't expect to see for another, you know, decade or two. Right. Heat wave last summer, 118 degrees in Portland, Oregon. That town in Canada where they broke the record Lytton in British Columbia, they broke the all time high temperature record for Canada one day, then they broke it again the next day, they broke it again the third day. And mm. on the fourth day, most of the town burned down. And most of those people are still without permanent homes. I mean, when we when we look at the, the flooding, when we look at the supersized hurricanes, when we look at the way that climate change is exacerbating our natural disasters, it is happening fast and furious. And California's on the front lines with 
The droughts, which always occur naturally, but are being exacerbated in a warmer world. When we look at the wildfires, which most of them are the result of accidental human ignition, but they're burning greater and greater area and filling the sky with that orange apocalyptic smoke. I mean, those pictures from, yeah. from oh. I mean, the smoke was so bad and, and including all the way up into British Columbia that you could get that smoke. I'm from Ontario myself. Last summer, you could, you could see the smoke in the air over Ontario. I mean, that's how much yeah. this travels. So California is on the front lines but here's where the science stands. And this is literally a quote from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change that releases these massive reports every six or seven years. And the last in the sequence of the three reports just came out last week. They concluded this, every year matters. Every bit of warming matters. Every action matters and every choice matters. Some of the changes and the impacts are already here today. Yeah. It's as if we've been smoking a pack of cigarettes a day for years and even decades, and we have some spots on our lungs. We have impaired lung capacity, but we don't have emphysema. We don't have lung cancer, and we're not dead yet. <laughs> so when's the best time to take action? As soon as possible. How much? As much as possible, because every little bit counts. And now is not the time to give in to doom and despair, because we're only doomed if we decide that we are. Oh, that's so well put. I want to mention that my colleague Mark is using the chat function to put in some web links uh, to topics that Dr. Hayho is raising and that, that we're discussing here. So I hear you on this, on this urgency. And you know, I spend and my colleagues spend a lot of our time right now protecting people and nature from the impacts of climate change. You know, we used to think about climate adaptation as kind of a wonky future planning exercise, right? Kind of a back burner issue. And now it's a matter of, of protecting lives. You know, you talk about that extreme heat, that same heat dome, you know, hit us down uh, 125, 27 degrees in parts of, of Los Angeles, um, where uh, some people don't have air conditioners and they don't have the, the urban green canopy to protect themselves. So um, really, you know, I, I think we appreciate that, you know, just that message of urgency. So I wanna ask you a little bit, um, about you know what 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 has brought you to write this book? You know you're a, you're a, again a renowned scientist. You're working you know on and with the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. I know that there's a lot of science that you could be doing, and you sort of opened up the aperture uh, and and wrote what I consider to be a really inspirational book. So I just want to ask you as a scientist, how what was your journey to actually becoming like an author and a speaker? Well, um, I also spend a lot of time writing the National Climate Assessment, and we're working on number five right now. And the reason I do that is because it explains how climate is, change is affecting us here and now where we live. Unless you live in Alaska, it's not about the polar bears or the ice sheets. Mm. It's about the wildfires. It's about the heat. It's about the beach erosion, the air quality. Um, it's about the snowpack in the Sierra Nevada mountains. It's about the water that's available to irrigate crops and comes out of your tap. So that's what I've been doing for a long time. But I talk to people about climate change too. And that actually started when I moved to Texas. When I moved to Texas, I was, and I still am, the only climate scientist within about a 200 mile radius. Wow. So it's not like California. California, especially in some areas like the Bay Area, you could throw a stone and hit a climate scientist. <laughs> <laughs> totally. You have so much abundance through, I mean, there's awesome programs that you have at, at Stanford, at, um, uh, at UCLA, um, at a lot of the different nonprofits and NGOs that you have throughout the organization or throughout the state. Even a lot of your, um, I work with the faith community, a lot of the Christian colleges in California, Azusa Pacific, Biola, Westmont and others. And of course, all of the UC schools throughout the state, all of them are absolutely outstanding on sustainability, on understanding climate impacts, working on clean energy. I mean, California really is a global leader in this area. Texas, not so much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, but we're working on changing that, right? But so, so I moved to Texas and there I was, you know, the only climate scientist within a 200 mile radius. And the reason I was there was because the university wanted my husband and I was the plus one they had to put up with to get him. <laughs> He's in linguistics, a totally different field. But pretty soon, within just a couple of months of getting there, I started to have people reach out to me and say, well, we're really curious about this issue. Would you come speak to our women's group, the book mm. club, the senior citizens home, the Rotary club? 
Second Baptist Church, not first, second. <laughs> they can afford to be a little more liberal in their views. And that's where I started to realize that a lot of people have a lot of questions. We tend to categorize people into the two extremes, you know, you know, believers or deniers. But there's a lot of people who have questions and who today are worried, but they don't know what to do. Mm. In fact, 70% of people across the U.S. are worried about climate change. Wow. 83% of mothers are worried about climate change, and that includes a lot of Republicans as well as Democrats. 86% of young people are worried. Yet, 8% are activated. And how do we bridge that gap between worry and activation by using our voices to share why it matters and what we can do about it. So that's how I started to give talks. And it just kind of expanded from, you know, talking to the Rotary Club and the women's group in Lubbock, Texas, to be speaking to people all across the world about this issue. And as I started to speak to people over the last few years, I started to notice that I was getting the same question again and again. I was starting to get it on a daily basis, hmm. whether I talked to a student, a colleague, a collaborator, um, whether I was giving a talk and I had questions come up during the talk. And the questions I would get were these two. What gives you hope? And how do I have a conversation about this? Mm. So that's why I wrote the book, because everyone wants to know where do we find hope and how do we have a conversation? And the two are intimately linked because hope is tied to action. If we feel like there's nothing we can do, that's when we despair. But if we realize that there's something we can do, that that giant boulder of climate action is not sitting at the bottom of a cliff with only a few hands on it trying to push it up, it's already at the top of the cliff. It's already rolling down the hill in the right direction. It already has millions of hands on it. And every single one of us can add our hand to that boulder and get it going faster. That's where we find our hope. And how do we start that process? Communication. How do humans do anything without communication? Well, and on that, I mean, hope through action frankly, is a, is a model that I've now adopted. And I hope you understand that. I, I think the people across the country are borrowing that because for those of us who work on climate change, you know, these are scary, scary times and discouraging times. And I've, I've really personally taken, you know, been energized by this idea of we, we retain hope by taking action. Um, so huge thanks for distilling that. Um, I wanted to talk, talk to you on the communication front. You know, we all have those relatives, if we're folks that are working on climate change, that, you know, you're always nervous about engaging on uh, with uh, Thanksgiving or something because you're like, oh, my God, they, you know, they think it's a hoax or maybe they don't, you know, they don't really understand what we do. And in your book, you, you draw on some work that I think Yale University and the survey there did around the six Americas. Can you just kind of talk about um, that framework, and then how do you, how would you recommend for those folks who are here today um, that they engage people that, you know, aren't already the believers or the folks that understand climate change? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So I mentioned earlier how so often we think of people as just falling into two groups, believers or deniers. And I don't like either of those names. I don't like the word believer because it implies it's a religion. <laughs> and yeah, you can point. say, I don't believe gravity is real, but if you step off the cliff, you're going down. Mm -hmm. And you can say, I think those thermometers are lying, but when the wildfire comes, it's not going to knock on your door and say, excuse me, do you believe? In yeah, fair warming? point. Fair point. I mean, just to confirm with you that that's not how it works, right? <laughs> not how it works. <laughs> okay, good. Um, but I don't like deniers either because that draws a line in the sand. And all too often it's applied to people who are doubtful or have questions just because everybody they know and trust is telling them false information. So I prefer the six Americas of global warming, which is, and maybe Mark could put a link to that in the chat, uh, which, which is something developed by Yale University that shows that really we fall into six groups. And the biggest groups are the groups at the alarmed end. So we have, and let me actually read you the numbers so people can, can see, according to the latest numbers, we have 33% of us are alarmed, 25% are concerned, 17% are cautious. That's the vast majority of people. Now, cautious people sometimes lead with their doubts, but if you don't say that's a good question, here's the answer, and hey, did you know that Texas gets 25% of its, of its electricity almost from clean energy? Always bring in a positive solution. If you don't meet them there, then they might get pushed away. 
So that's a good question. Here's the short answer. And now let me tell you what a good solution looks like. Then at the other end of the spectrum, you have 10% who are doubtful and only 9% who are dismissive. Hmm. Now, even though they're 9%, most of us know at least one person who's dismissive. <laughs> I have a family member, you might too. <laughs> it might be a neighbor, a colleague, you know, somebody that we've known for a long time. They're the person who's always posting on Facebook, who when you're having dinner together is always bringing up the latest soundbite they heard about how those scientists are just making it up or ice sheets are actually growing, not shrinking. And when we say we need to have conversations, often our mind jumps to, oh, those are the people we need to talk to. Those are the people we don't need to talk to. <laughs> the nine percenters, it honestly takes a miracle to change their mind. And I feel like I might have seen a miracle or two in a long, you know, thousands of conversations, but I don't think I had anything to do with that, that <laughs> happening. With dismissive people, the best thing to say is, if they're your relative, family member, somebody you're close to, I love you and let's talk about something else. Or you could even say, you're wrong and, and then insert a fact about how 90% of new energy installed around the world last year was clean energy, or there's more jobs in solar energy than there is in the coal industry. Or don't you think we should be investing in energy independence? Yes. Well, then let me tell you about energy independence and how it can only be achieved through clean energy. Leave the dismissives, focus on everybody else. And remember the biggest gap is not between those who do or don't agree it's real. The biggest gap are between those who are already worried about it but they're not activated. And mm. that's where our conversation can make the biggest difference. That's really helpful. So I, one thing I found in your book, it was kind of counterintuitive is, you know, you don't have to bone up on the most recent detailed scientific facts about planetary global warming. A lot of it is relating to people on where they're at. So can you just talk about that? Like what would be your strategy if, if we meet and we're at a zoom convention and I talk to you and I'm, I'm, I'm sort of skeptical about, about climate change. How do you approach that conversation as a, as a scientist? Mm -hmm. Well, not only that, but we are so inundated in scientific information about ice sheets melting, about polar bears being de populations being decimated. We're just so overwhelmed with these fearful and accurate scientific facts that more of them just paralyze us. Mm. And that's exactly the opposite. We don't want to be paralyzed. We want to be moving forward <laughs> as much as possible, as soon as possible. So even with people, with people who aren't concerned, it's because they've heard so much that they just dismiss it. With people who are concerned, they've heard so much that they're worried, but that's not going to motivate them. What's going to motivate them is understanding how it affects us here and now in ways that are relevant to our life and understanding what real solutions look like and how they can add their hand to the boulder. So in answer to your question, I had a real life experience when I was doing the audio version of the book um, and they asked me if I wanted to read it and I said, I'd like to. And they're like, okay, well, you have to get it done in two weeks from now. Yeah. And I was like, what? <laughs> so I ended up going in over the August long weekend last summer to a local studio here in Lubbock, Texas. And they had one sound engineer who was in there with me to do the, the recording. And then they had the, the audio book person on Zoom listening to me, getting me to repeat things if I didn't say them properly. And what happened was after I did the first couple of hours and I came out to take a little break, rest my voice, get a drink, the sound engineer said, I didn't realize your book was about climate change. I have oh a few questions. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> yes. So he was not dismissive because if he'd been dismissive, he would have immediately launched in with, you know, it's fake and here's all the evidence why it's fake. But he was doubtful. And he was doubtful become, because he comes from a community and a culture and a location where all he heard from people around him was that it isn't real. So here's what I did. I said, you know, how long have you lived here? Um, what do you enjoy doing? Um, and pretty soon he was telling me about he, how he loved skiing and I love skiing too, and how he had been skiing at these places in New Mexico where I love skiing too, and how he had seen the ski season getting shorter and shorter. He was telling me, not me telling him. <laughs> and then he loves fishing and he's been going to the same lake all his life. And that was something he did as a child and he wants to take his grandchildren too, but the lake was getting choked with algae and it was getting much warmer and there was so much development. And there was fertilizer, you know, coming into the lake and polluting it. So pretty soon he was telling me how things had changed. And so all I had to do was say, I agree with you. I'm worried about these things too. And did you know that the seasons are getting shorter because it's getting warmer? 
And did you know that affects people's water supply and it affects the local economy, of course. And this is what we see happening all around the world. And he was also saying how he was also a fellow Christian. I was saying, and that, well, that's why I care about it because it affects the poorest people right here as well as on the other side of the world. So all through recording the book, I would go out and then we'd have these second conversations, <laughs> like actually doing what I was talking about in the book. And then I would go back and record more of the book. And then on Tuesday, somebody who my husband knows who works with him texted my husband and was like, what did you do with Steve? <laughs> <laughs> he said, we can't believe the things that he's saying around the office. <laughs> so, oh my God. So, so I mean, th these are the types, you know, sometimes it doesn't, you know, it doesn't happen that quickly. Sometimes it might take months or even a year or two, but here's the lesson. Where do you begin the conversation? You begin the conversation with something that you agree on. And in my book, I talk about how people, you know, um, a NASA scientist came up to me and said, how do I talk about this with my friends? I'm so worried about this, but I don't know how to start. And I said, what do you like doing with your friends? And he said, well, we, we cook together and we eat dinner together. I said, well, there you go. Start with food. Talk about how climate change is affecting specialty crops like coffee or chocolate or bananas. Talk about how it's affecting wine or beer. Talk about how it's affecting the nutritional content of food and low income countries where people already don't have enough to eat. And then another woman came up to me and said, well, how do I talk about it with my grandma? And I said, well, what do you do with your grandma? And she said, we knit together. I said, aha, I knit too. <laughs> so I know exactly what to say. There's these great warming stripes that you've probably seen. And Marco put a link in the chat. It's showyourstripes.info, I think is the website. And you can find the warming stripes for every state and even for a lot of cities. Every stripe is a year. And if it's colder than average, it's blue. If it's about average, it's white. And if it's a bit warmer than average, pink, and then dark red, if it's a lot warmer than average. And you can actually turn the warming stripes into a knitting pattern. You can knit a scarf or a blanket. And so I said, get the knitting stripes for your grandmother's whole life and start the year she was born and then get her to tell you stories about each year. Like, oh, that was a dark blue year, grandma. Do you remember it being really cold? Oh, wow, that was a really red year. Like, what was that year like? Oh, now all the years are red. How have you noticed things changing? Get your grandma to tell you how things are changing rather than you telling her. And when we do that, we're respecting people. We're honoring their lived experience. We're saying implicitly, you care about the right things. And because you care about the right things, clearly you care about climate change, even if you didn't realize it. And that's a 180 from the way that we normally address these issues, because normally we start with the assumption that you don't care about the right things. And you need to care about X, Y, and Z before you're allowed to care about climate change because you can only care about climate change for the same reasons I do. Right. And that comes with a hefty side of judgment, which typically no one reacts too well. <laughs> well, and, that, that, and that's so helpful. How do you balance that with the urgency we face? You know, I note from my social media feed that many of your colleagues, scientists, um, have taken a part in civil disobedience over the last week and been arrested in, in parts of the world to basically say, you know, we don't have time. Uh, and so, you know, that could be characterized as contrasting with those more quiet, you know, conversations where you're meeting people where they're at, but it also seems like that's essential. So how do you as a scientist that knows the urgency of the crisis balance that with working to bring people along that are not necessarily going to, you know, react positively to seeing people get arrested on the TV? That's a great question. And basically, I think we need it all. I think we need these conversations at every level across the whole spectrum. And I'm a big advocate for having conversations within whatever spheres you're already in. Mm. So you might work at one, I should say, <laughs> might work mm. at, we know we all know where you work. Um, mm. You might work at a, at a bank. Well, a bank is a great place to be having a conversation about how we as an organization could be contributing towards climate solutions. Say you work at a school, you have a tremendous opportunity to educate not only the next generation, but their parents as well. What if you work in the health prof care prof uh, profession? Healthcare professionals are speaking out about the health impacts of, say, breathing in all that wildfire smoke that, of course, is exacerbated by climate change. Um, what if you work in the wine grape industry? You should definitely, you can definitely be talking about how we can be more resilient, but also what we can do to raise people's awareness about this issue. No matter who you are, no matter where you live, no matter where you work, no matter what organization you're part of, you have a unique voice that you can use. And we can use that voice on social media. We can use that voice to engage in civil disobedience. We can use that voice to speak through our money. 
We can use that voice to speak through our personal examples. We can use our voice in so many ways. And I was really encouraged to be part of um, developing the website for the Don't Look Up movie, which of course is a movie about how there's this asteroid coming to hit the earth and nobody's listening to the scientists, which is a metaphor for climate change. Right. The website they developed, which is um, Don't Look Up, Count Us In, and Mark is great about putting all those links in the chat, so that'll be there just in a second. Um, it talks about what we as individuals can do about climate change. And it doesn't start with eating more plants or recycling or changing your light bulbs. It starts with talking about it, joining a group to magnify or amplify your voice and talk about it. And so that's what some are doing through civil disobedience. That's what some are doing through organizations like Protect Our Winters for winter athletes to speak up about um, you know, about how we want to protect our winters because of climate change. There's organizations for mothers like Science Moms that I'm part of. There's organizations for people who are Catholic or Christian or Muslim. There's um, organizations for Rotarians. <laughs> There's organizations for healthcare professionals. Um, make your money count. Hold politicians accountable. Push for climate headlines. Speak up at work. And of course, eat more plants travel responsibly, be kind to your mind, and talk about it. Always mm. talk about it. So there's this spectrum, and we need people at every point in the spectrum. We need scientists doing good science, publishing good science. We need scientists interacting with scientists in other fields to, like we did for our California project originally, connect climate change to everything from health to air quality to water supply to coastal erosion. We need people interacting with policymakers and decision makers like yourself, giving you the information that you need and the political will that you need to implement these changes. We need people who are speaking out about it on social media and, you know, the kids like on TikTok, for example, and, um, you know, Instagram and of course, there's all other social media platforms. They are really leading the way on that. We need people speaking up where they worship, where they live, where they play. Um, at every level we need people. And so whoever you are, you have a role to play that nobody else can. And it sort of reminds me of a conversation that I had with a colleague at UC Berkeley. I was I was there just before the pandemic in those like pre-pandemic era. That was like days. 15 years ago, right? I thought it was more like 20, but I'll, I'll <laughs> go with 15, <laughs> yes. And I still remember, and this is actually a conversation I've had a few times with a few different colleagues. So I don't wanna put anyone on the spot because it's happened a few times. This colleague came up to me and said, you know, I've been trying to reach out to local faith-based groups and congregations mm -hmm. because I've seen that that's what you're doing. And I think it's essential to get them on board with, with climate action. And I agree with that. But I haven't been able to get my foot in the door. What would you recommend? So I said, the place to start is the place that you're closest to. So, you know, what church or congregation do you attend? What is your background? And he said, oh, well, I'm an atheist. So I said- Probably not the best messenger. Stop, yeah. <laughs> You're not the best person for them. And don't worry, they'll find, they'll be somebody else because we're all in this together. What do you do? What do you love? And he said, science. And I said, well, of course, <laughs> we all love science. But I said, what else? Like, are you a birder or a hiker? You know, are you part of the Rotary Club or a community organization? Do you volunteer with anything? No, no, no. And then he said, well, and he said this sort of tentatively as if it, it, didn't matter. He said, well, I am a diver. And I'm like, well, a diver. And he's like, well, actually, I'm really serious about this. And I do a lot of diving. And, you know, he started to, you know, tell me all of his accomplishments, which were substantial in that field. And I said, well, don't you think divers need to know about climate change? I mean, what's happening in the oceans is in many ways much more faster and more severe than what's happening on land. I think every diver needs to know about climate change. They need to know how they could help with citizen science programs. They need to know how the place they love is changing. They need to know how they could be advocates for climate action. That person, he's the perfect person to speak to divers. And I'm not because I'm not a diver. So every single one of us has something unique that we can do, a way that we can use our voice in many different ways. And all of us have that voice and we can express it sometimes verbally, sometimes through writing, sometimes through what we do and people see us doing it, sometimes through how we invest or where we put our money and how people see us doing that. However we do that, we can express the need for climate action at every level. Absolutely. I want to ask you a, a personal question. You know, I think you, fair, you fill a fair, fairly unique niche as a world-recognized climate scientist and um, somebody who I think describes yourself as an evangelical Christian. So you're a person of faith 
there are so many Americans who are people, you know, of faith. Um, can you talk about your journey as a scientist and and somebody who is a person of faith and and how you talk about both? And uh, you you talk really uh, persuasively in the book around um, how you know uh, the you know Christian congregations can get behind climate change. I think we just don't see a lot of that in the popular media. So just interested no. in your thoughts on this. We don't at all. And I think that's a serious lack because there are a lot of people in the faith community who are already on board. Um, Interfaith Power and Light is a national organization that began in California. You've got in San Francisco, you've got Bishop Mark of the Episcopal Church, who's a leader in climate action. You've, I mentioned earlier, you've got a number of Christian colleges, Azusa Pacific, Westmont, and others, that are leaders in educating the next generation on the importance of climate change, the biodiversity crisis, sustainability, and more. The reason I'm a climate scientist is because I'm a person of faith. That is literally the reason why, when I learned how urgent climate change is, and when I learned that it's fundamentally a justice issue, that it's not fair, that was what made me realize that I need to do everything I can to help fix this problem. I believe that we are called to love others. And how loving is it to sort of stick our fingers in our ears, metaphorically speaking, and cover our eyes and pretend that climate change is not already affecting real people here and now today. Mm. So I, I believe that if you take the Bible seriously, that you'd be out at the front of the line demanding climate action. And I know from talking to many others of different faiths that those core concepts of stewardship um, caring for nature and caring for those less fortunate than us are core components of pretty much every major world religion. And I've talked to many colleagues, you know, who are humanists. Of course they care about people too. Of course they care about this planet as well. It's really, I think it's better to say it's a core human value to care about this planet and to care about each other. And when we connect what's in our head to our heart, it unlocks our potential, I feel like, in a completely different way. And it engages our hands in action in a way that just knowing it up here doesn't. So when we look around, there's so much encouraging action to see in faith-based communities, whether it's Catholic communities, of course, led by Pope Francis, who yeah. takes climate change so seriously, he wrote a whole encyclical about it. <laughs> um, there's organizations like Green Muslims. There's organizations like Young Evangelicals for Climate Action that have over 20,000 young evangelicals around the whole country petitioning for wow. clean energy legislation at the state and the national level. There are um, church leaders um, there are many scientists who are people of faith. Over 70% of scientists at top research universities in the U.S. Would, would call themselves spiritual people. And most of us who are climate scientists, we do this because we're motivated, whatever label we would put on ourselves, or not, no label at all, we're doing it because of what we care about, because of what's mm -hmm. in our hearts, because we're passionate about the people who are being affected and about the impacts that our actions are having on our planet. So I really feel like when we connect our head to our heart and engage our hands, that's when change happens. And we have to start with what's in people's hearts. And so in the book, I talk about doing an inventory and sort of looking through who you are. And then that's the way, those are the ways that you can engage with other people. So I can engage with people who are interested in science, obviously, as a scientist. I can engage with people who are parents as a mom. And that's part of why we started the Science Moms organization, which is just sciencemoms.com. We do have a few dads signing up as well, so don't worry. <laughs> There's no discrimination there at all. Everybody's welcome. Also, grandparents, aunts, uncles, godparents, anybody who has children in their lives, go to Science Moms and check it out. Um, I love skiing, so I talk to people from the perspective of being a winter athlete. I'm not a great gardener, but I enjoy it. And I love talking to garden club people and, and master naturalists about, about what we can do to be part of the solution. And of course, I'm a Christian as well. And so those are sort of the ways that I can connect with people through science, through being a parent, through the things that I love, um, gardening, cooking, knitting, skiing, um, through being a person of faith. And, you know, I don't hunt, so I'm not a great person to talk to people who do, but there are scientists who do, and they're the perfect person to talk to them. Um, I'm, you know, uh, I'm not a member of the Rotary Club. I've talked to quite a few Rotary Clubs, but I'd like to encourage people who are members of the Qantas Club or the Rotary Club or the Lions Club. You're the perfect person to talk to them about climate change. So I'm going to put you on the spot, if you don't mind, since you've read the book. 
Oh boy. What are, give me a couple of things on, on your inventory. Who are you? Where do you love? What do you love? Who do you love? Oh, I forgot to mention, obviously I'm from Canada. I live in Texas. Talk about those too. Give me a couple of things that you can connect with people on. Yeah, well, I mean, first of all, on the job, I've been connecting with people on climate change, less about climate science and more about the impacts that we have to deal with at our agency. So wildfire and drought, extreme heat, you know, while California gets, you know, perceived as a place that's really, you know, driving climate action forward, there's a whole part of California where you run into a lot of doubt uh, about climate change. And when I go into those discussions, I don't talk about, you know, I don't start with climate change. I, I talk about, you know, the change on the ground and what it means, you know, to the resource in their communities. And we know things are changing. So I would say one on that, but I'm also, I'm a big outdoors person. I'm a hiker. Uh, and so on that level, really connecting with how that's changing our ability to recreate outside. You know, we are now moving into having a smoke season in California. You know, you folks are planning their vacations in some instances around, well, it, can we anticipate that there's going to be toxic smoke in that part of the state? Mm -hmm. So it's really impacting our ability to be outside, right? I'm a parent as well to a seven-year-old. And that's really, really uh, compelling to me talking to, to parents about, you know, it becomes very real the future when we're thinking about what, what we're leaving our kids. Um, so that, that would be one as well. Uh, I'm a lover of sports. So I play a lot of sports and watch a lot of sports. And so um, my uh, challenge would be, you know, I, I follow a lot of soccer, you know, so how does soccer change? Um, I'll note that, you know, the world, the world cup is taking place in, November this year in Qatar, Qatar, because it's going to be so hot in Qatar during the normal time that you can't actually play. We're experiencing that with kids that are soccer players across California that are in communities with extreme heat problems where they're actually not able to be uh, outside. Mm -hmm. So those are a few, those are a few examples. You should have prepared me so I could have a few more, but I appreciate <laughs> that, a spontaneous question. Um, let me, I let me, that. You, you did a great job. That was perfect. And I hope everybody's listening is doing the same for themselves as well. Yeah, I, 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 that, that's so powerful. And not only, you know, engage where you're at, but also take action in your community. Mm -hmm. You know, I do feel like people are really scared. If you believe in climate change, not believe, but if you recognize climate change um, and, you know, it still feels paralyzing. And I have a lot of friends, even in my life that really aren't, aren't doing anything. Right. And so, you know, maintain hope through action is such a powerful mm -hmm. message of yours. Mm -hmm. I want to integrate some questions from our participants here today. And some there's some uh, all they're all over the map. So if you want to ask a question to Dr. Hayho, please uh, log on or click on the Q&A button. First one's kind of a fun one, which is Kirsten wants to know the list of books behind you. Give us a sense of what's in your book pile. <laughs> um, put you on the spot. Are those are those a couple few of books that you that you like? that you'd yes. recommend? Oh, so so I read voraciously. <laughs> and I fully admit that the books here are not only books I'm reading, but they're color coordinated. <laughs> and ah, I, cha I change you do that too. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I love it. So 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 they're legit books, but I also have um, other books. And so let me let me highlight a couple of them for you. So first of all, it's the one that's sitting right in front of me. And we didn't plan this either. These are just the books I have right here. This is by a fellow climate scientist called Matt Winning, who is a comedian as well. And he wrote this book during his wife's pregnancy and the birth of their first child. So he reflects in a very thoughtful way about the incredible expression of hope that it is to bring a child into this world mm. during these times of change. It's really powerful, funny, but also powerful. Um, and then I will hold up this whole list so you can see. This is sort of a selection that really almost um, encompasses my interests. Here we go. We've got um, a book about fungi on the bottom. Just learning about nature is so incredible. Nature is awesome. And the more you learn about it, the more incredible you think it is. Then we've got The Future Earth by Eric Holthouse, which is a really thoughtful reflection on how do we respond to what we know. And it's even got like an action workbook in the back hmm. on what you can do as a group to get going on climate change. Mark Carney is a Canadian economic expert who talks about how we can really put a price on the impacts that we're having and on the benefits of the actions that we're taking. 
Water is sort of like the fungi, but it's even more essential to, I mean, we can't survive without water, yet what most of us know about water is very little. Then at the top, we've got the soil will save us, which talks about something that we often don't think about, and that is that we have too much carbon in the atmosphere, but if we put more carbon back in the soil and in vegetation and ecosystems where we want it, that would help us grow more crops, it would give us healthier ecosystems, it would improve biodiversity, and it would address a whole host of problems. Oh, and it would help with climate change too. So agricultural climate solutions are really one of the most exciting things. And that's something that the Nature Conservancy does a lot of that help us grow better, more drought resistant, healthier crops today. Oh, and they help with climate change tomorrow. And then at the very end, let me put these books back here and show you the last one. Um, I've got um, a great book, which I love, No Cure for Being Human. <laughs> <laughs> by a fellow Canadian. Just reflections on, on life, life in this current era and a reminder of who we are, um, you know, what we're here for and how we can live our lives. Wow. Mm -hmm. I, that's incredible. And I'm, I, uh, I'm recording this, of course, so anybody can share this discussion with others and this will live on our website. And so I'm going to come back to that because I love getting uh, good book recommendations from smart people I admire. So huge thanks there. Um, and I'll note, I'm really proud that California is investing heavily in healthy soils. Our My colleague, our agricultural secretary, Karen Ross, sings the gospel on this, speaks the gospel in the sense of getting out there and talking about how we can improve agricultural production, retain water and store carbon. Yes. So uh, we're really excited and actually spending tens of millions of dollars uh, supporting farmers, ranchers that are doing that. So really excited about that. So back with your science hat on, Lee asked a really good, uh, she makes the point that we're actually kicking off our fifth climate assessment in California. So you talked about, I think that first assessment or one of the first climate assessments, we're really trying to evolve the, the assessments to continue to evolve our understanding of how climate change is going to impact us and what we can do. Parenthetically, I'm really excited that we've got a portion of this that is instituting tribal wisdom and traditional ecological knowledge as something we need to invest in as we decide what we're going to do. Um, so um, I want to just ask you, is there any research that comes to the top of your mind, asks Leah, about what the state should focus on for this update that will build on the new Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's projections and, and help us sort of downscale um, that work to understand impacts? Yes, that's a great question. So uh, as I mentioned, the U.S. National Climate Assessment is also underway as well, the number five, too. Um, although California, um, no, California and the U.S. started about the same time. The first California assessment was a little bit after the first U.S., but then the second one was before the second U.S. So you're right on target. Um, so, so what's really relevant right now is understanding um, how we're responding to this. How are we responding and how can we respond at scale? in terms of the three main things we need to do. We need to reduce and eliminate our carbon emissions. We need to take carbon out of the atmosphere through nature-based solutions, and we need to build resilience to the impacts we can no longer avoid. Those are the three big categories. So we can still refine, and I still work in this field myself, still refining our future projections. I'm rolling out a big data set of station-based projections for all the weather stations in North Central America this coming year. Um, we can still refine our projections, but translating those into what does it mean for people on the ground and parsing that out to where we understand that in big cities, due to historic racist redlining practices, for example, and you referred to this earlier, low income neighborhoods during a heat wave can be 10 to 15 degrees hotter than higher income neighborhoods with better tree canopy cover in the same city. Low income neighborhoods are often located more in flood zones. They are people who have to work outside are much more vulnerable to wildfire smoke and hazardous air pollution. And they often don't have a choice as to whether they can do that or not. So um, back almost 15 years ago, I actually worked on a study with people in California who actually showed that different populations are disproportionately vulnerable to climate change impacts. Even if they live in the same place, the nature of the location of their homes and their work make them more vulnerable. So really just parsing out how climate change directly impacts our agriculture, our food, our water, our health, the safety of our homes, our businesses and our industry, as well as our coastlines, how it differentially affects us 
It isn't the same just because we live in the same place. And what robust win, 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 win solutions look like? Because we don't have time for single wins. Totally so agree an there. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And that's a great segue into a question that Christina asks about the importance of elevating and building upon climate activism that's been occurring in historically marginalized communities, including BIPOC communities. You know, you started your um, talk here today talking about climate change impacts aren't fair, and you were just articulating the disproportionate impact. So, you know, what role do, uh, do marginalized communities and leadership within marginalized communities and among leaders of color have in this movement? Enormous, uh, because climate change is at its core a justice issue. So just as climate impacts us all, but it doesn't impact us all equally, in the same way, we need those win-win-win solutions I was talking about that benefit us all, but that benefit those who are most impacted the most. Climate projects or climate solutions can be framed such that they don't benefit those who are suffering the most. And mm. we need to use that, that lens of justice and equity to look at those solutions and say, how can we make sure that we're addressing some of these historic inequities and injustices at the same time? So for example, in low-income neighborhoods, greening low-income neighborhoods, providing green spaces, which often they don't have. Well, it turns out green spaces can soak up rainwater so that it reduces flood risk. Green spaces provide a place to take your kids to play and be outside, which improves our mental health. Trees also filter air quality because often those have much poorer air quality because they're located near freeways or industrial centers. They also help shade the area during heat waves. Oh, and they take up carbon too. So those types of solutions are win, 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 win solutions. And that's what we need. We don't have time for, like I said, for the, the single wins. Yeah, totally. You know, Galen uh, brings up a, a question or a statement. It'd be great to have a one pager or key talking or information points to use as guides for talks to groups. Anything in the works from the C, the, our natural resources agency media team? That's a good question. But, you know, where are there any? So, uh, Galen, thank you. We'll, we'll take that on our, ourselves because I think building off Dr. Hayo's talk, that's something we could do or can do. But any, is there any you know, sort of pragmatic information on the, on the internet around you know, how to approach this? I mean, obviously your, your book is a good guide, uh, but is anything, any sort of, sort of speaking points or, or you know, sort of things to remember as they're doing that? Yes, that's a great question. I love having like short talking points like that because it's so useful. I also have short videos. So I have this little series called Global Weirding on YouTube and the web address is globalweirdingseries.com. Um, and there's one for um, the Western US, including California, talking about impacts. There's some about solutions, there's some about communication. But in terms of talking about it, I actually just saw a resource right now, and this is part of why I like Twitter, because there's so many great resources in Twitter. Um, here it is, I just found it. Um, Eco America has these short little fact sheets, and they have a fact sheet called Five Steps to Effective Climate Communication. And I'm going to put the copy the link and I'm going to put the link in the chat right here. That link should take you right to their fact sheet. If you want something a little bit longer, there's a great organization called Climate Outreach that has a manual called Talking Climate. And um, it is, let's see, here we go. Talking Climate. I'm going to put that in here too. And then obviously that's what my book talks about too, although my book is more than one page long. That's so that's really helpful. And, and Kathy had uh, asked about uh, digestible and understandable data for policymakers to bring to decision making tables. She actually is on her local water board. Um, and I imagine these places are good to connect into uh, scientific data where it's helpful. It is. And then the National Climate Assessment has regional summaries and sectoral summaries. And I imagine that um, the California assessments do too. So with the California assessments, which there's a link in the chat, there should be summaries for each sector. So just get the water summary, read it and, and bring it to your water board with you. It'll have your talking points. Yeah. And I'll note that with our colleagues at the Office of Planning and Research, we're collectively shaping the fifth climate assessment now. So for policymakers like Kathy or local, local resource managers or leaders, help us understand what questions we should be answering. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
this little short summaries is great. And I've I'm, got also, a... I'm also putting, um, putting a book discussion questions on my website as well. Oh, excellent. Because that's a, that's a question that Sylvia just asked. Yeah. Um, here's a tough one. Um, but yeah, the challenge is you have to answer rather short because we've got just a few more minutes. What the heck do we do about the federal the federal policy discussion in Washington D.C.? Can we get our leaders to make collective progress on this? Would we should we should we focus there? Tough question. California is such a model because, as you pointed out, you know Schwarzenegger was the first person to enact greenhouse gas emission reduction standards, and he was a Republican governor. Often, the policies that California enacts, like fuel efficiency standards, they filter up to the national level. My feeling is at the federal level, that's going to be the last place we see change. Cities. I live in Texas, the city of Houston, the city of Dallas, obviously the city of Austin, the city of San Antonio too. They are leading the way. They are have climate action plans, resilience plans, Paris targets, corporations, the Microsofts of the world, the Googles of the world. Their goal is for every single Google search to be carbon zero. If you look at what's happening below the federal level, there's huge amounts of change. We can't stop working at the federal level. We have to keep going. But when we realize how many hands are already on the boulder, then when we go to the federal level, you can have that impetus of, look at what's already happening in your district. Look at the cities in your district. Look at the businesses in your district and the corporations. Look at the organizations in your district. Look at everything they're doing. Why can't we do that too? So. We really need to work at every level, but if we just focus on the federal level, it's easy to get discouraged and depressed. But when we look at what states, universities, cities, corporations, organizations, nonprofits are doing, when we look at the, the California Climate Corps, how individuals can sign up to make a difference, I love that program. When, um, when I look at what the Nature Conservancy is doing, if I, if I need hope these days, I just look at what they're doing in terms of preserving land, in terms of investing in farmers, in terms of um, working to build resilient forests. I mean, there's just so many good news stories that when we find out about these good news stories, we can't help but share them with people. And then people realize, you know what, there are things that we can do to help fix this problem. And maybe I have a role to play. Yeah, that's so powerful. I totally agree. And you know, if we just focus on where there's disagreement, we're not going to take the action that we need to. And to your point, you know, we are snowballing action across the country, across the world, and certainly in California. And it's so, so powerful to talk about, you know, the action on the ground. There's that, you know, old adage, we are the people we've been waiting for, you know. And so one thing I take from you is, you know, don't wait for someone to tell you um, that it's important to act. If you recognize it's important to act, act, and do that by by lifting your voice and engaging people that may not uh, be otherwise engaged. Well, listen, there's so there's more questions flowing in, but I want to respect your time. I want to respect everyone else's time. This has been such an incredible conversation, and I just want to thank you on on behalf of you know the folks that are doing the work in California and beyond. Your leadership, your ability to articulate. Um, the science and connect it to our daily lives. To me, like like no other, you know, argument I've heard really makes the case for what we need to do uh, moving forward. So I want to give you the last word, Dr. Hayhoe. What you know, as 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 we leave you, as you leave us in California, um, what wise words do you have to send us on our way? Who we already are. And who everybody around us already is, is the perfect person to care about climate change. And mm. if they don't care, if they care and they're not acting, it's because they don't know how they can make a difference. And so really spending that time to listen rather than talk at, realizing that the goal is to bring more people into the conversation, not to talk to them about climate change. Understanding that fear is what holds a lot of us back, fear and guilt. And those are the two hardest chapters to write in my book. Mm. Um, fear and guilt is what's standing in people's way. And when we judge people, when we wave a judgy finger at them, when we condemn them, when we implicitly um, communicate as if, you know, you don't care about the right things and I do, so you need to be more like me, that isn't going to change people. Rather, when we realize that, let's start at the top. We all want a better future. We all do. We all want clean water to come out of the tap when we turn it on. We want there to be food. We want there to be a safe place for our family to live. We want there to be a healthy economy where we can have a good job and decent work. We want there to be um, 
a beautiful and abundant nature that we can show and teach our kids from. We all want those things and we aren't going to get them if we don't tackle the climate and the biodiversity crises. Those things will literally not exist for anybody. So when we start there and we realize everybody does want those things, then we're starting from a very different place. And then we can say, how can we together contribute towards that solution? Hmm. Well, I will leave it there because those are incredibly powerful words to end our discussion. For those tuning in, huge thanks for the work that you do, the work that you're doing on the ground, whether you work in governments or across communities in, as a member of a faith community or really wherever you're at. Thank you for your work. Mark has put in our chat um, where you can find a recording of this. And once again, huge thanks to Dr. Catherine Hayhoe for joining us here today. We'll see you next time on the California uh, Secretary Speaker Series.